Hi, so I'm Lachlan, and uh, aside from the technical difficulties, I think I'm the only thing standing between people and uh, an overdue coffee and bathroom break. So I'll try and win us some time back, if I possibly can. Um, this was a really fun uh, case for us because this was work done during a pitch, which is always some of the most fun times for a planner. You get to really look at things with a naive eye and ask the silly questions without people judging you for not knowing things. And it was also fun because it was a kind of win one, get two free deal where it was Philips 66, but if we win that, we get these other two brands with it. And they're uh, regionally focused brands that all have really interesting kind of iconic histories, literally iconic across the, you know, if you drive across the states, you see the iconography of these brands in the landscape and how, as they've evolved over the years. Um, and they have very different heritages, they have very different geographic footprints, and they also target different segments within an overall market segmentation study that Cantar did for Philips. I'm not going to bore you with the details of those, I'm going to caricature them a little bit, so apologize for oversimplifying this somewhat, but you'll get the idea. Philips 66 is all about busy suburban families, think uh, suburban St. Louis, Kansas, Oklahoma, really living very, very busy, full lives. Um, go to the West Coast, which is where 76 is, and it's a slightly younger target audience they're going after. Um, less likely to have kids and much more concerned about the cultural relevance and uh, you know, kind of tech savviness that they have in their lives. And then younger still, Conoco is really all about a couple of markets, but mainly Denver, and uh, it targets an even younger group within uh, drivers, so young adults and really college-aged kids is really where their focus is. So we were like, great, that's fantastic. We've got these three very different, very interesting, iconic brands to play with. Um, but the first challenge that we got right at the start, and this was kind of the, the premise of the brief, was for various reasons that were partly about company, corporate, um, presentation, but also about some of the back-end mechanics when it comes to doing promotions or loyalty apps and that kind of thing. They wanted one strategy that could support these very different brands and very different regions. Um, we could execute it differently. The creative didn't have to be the same, but they wanted one underlying strategy so they could pivot off that for the same kind of promotions, the same kind of mechanics, and they could present themselves corporately to a lot of their other business partners in a, in a singular way. The other interesting thing there is, cool, three brands that are in a market where no one really gives a shit about the brand. No one's thinking, I'm going to drive 10 miles further to this other gas station. Um, it's really about price, that's why we have those huge signs by the side of the road, and location. So where's the one that's at the uh, exit that I get off the freeway to get home in the evening, or you know, that's uh, by my kid's school, or that kind of thing. Um, although I, I always tend to think that in these sort of situations it's kind of liberating, because it reminds you of the power of uh, communications and marketing and advertising as a weak force, and you have to kind of embrace that, and go, okay, well how, we're not going to persuade anyone here? How are we going to nudge them to turn left, not right at the junction? Maybe to go one junction further, probably not two or three junctions further, that's probably unrealistic, but how do we just win that uh, nudge moment of preference for, for people? <coughs> not least because uh, at one point I think someone suggested we should map the consumer journey and it was like, well, it's about four seconds from the fuel gauge coming on until when they see the first gas station, so let's not do that. Um, and it's also a stop that people don't really want to do. If you had the choice, if I could wave a magic wand and you didn't have to uh, use these brands, people really wouldn't save really long road trips where you, you want that stop. But for the most part, people don't want to stop. I will say, however, that was one of these things that we just assumed as received wisdom. That seems obvious. But it became important later, as you'll see in a minute, that we actually quantified that a little bit. We stopped from it and said, well, let's just check with people. How do they feel about stopping for gas? And sure enough, hardly anyone loves it. Few people hate it, but most people are pretty ambivalent. It's not outright hate, but it's not something people are passionate about, obviously. But it was good to have that benchmark. Again, you'll see why in a minute. Um, and the other thing which uh, I think immediately sprang to people's minds more sensibly than the consumer journey part was, well, let's tackle the experience. The experience sucks. There's so many things we could do with the, the experience of stopping. 
all kinds of barriers in the way of that, not least that Philips actually doesn't own any of the stations, uh, so they're independently operated, how much wages are paid to the staff, whether they get any training at all, whether the bathrooms are clean, what stuff they sell in the C store, whether the lighting's good or not, not controlled by the brand. So again, you're almost uh, freed by how restricted your, your uh, avenues of, of attack are. So what did we do with that? There were two pretty simple insights that guided what we did. And um, the first one kind of comes from this. People didn't really talk about the gas station when we asked them about the category. They talked about this, which is maybe one of the most terrifying things people see in their day-to-day -day life. It's like, this is not a good moment. <laughs> However, when people talked about the fuel gauge and talked about how terrible that is and how that really, you know, I mean, that can really break your day when you see that. They talk almost more so about how awesome that feels and how brilliant it is when you have that feeling. And it was a feeling. It wasn't just, oh, it's obviously better not to run out of gas. It was a feeling. It felt great. Uh, so that was fascinating. And we decided to ask the question. So we went back to exactly the same consumers through exactly the same. It was, this was all done through DSCOUT, where we could go back to the same groups of people uh, throughout the pitch process. And we just changed the question, which I think is an interesting uh, kind of mi minor point about think really carefully about how you ask questions. Because if you ask the same people, do you like stopping for gas? No, they don't really like that. If you ask them literally a few questions later, uh, do you like refueling your tank? And they're talking about cars here. They love it. <laughs> they really love it. It's the same question, isn't it? Well, maybe it's not. Uh, clearly it's not. Um, and we all know that feeling elsewhere in our day-to-day -day lives. You don't have to be a driver. One of these things is about the worst thing that can happen in your day other than running out of gas and being stuck at the side of the road. The other feels fantastic. Um, we did want to be careful that this wasn't just us uh, playing spin doctor and doing a trick of language to kind of fool people into thinking they cared about something. So again, we used the, um, the, the mobile research that we were doing to get people to track their mood during days that they knew they were going to have a gas stop, have to refuel. And despite telling us that they don't like to stop, despite not wanting to stop, you can track that their mood actually increases uh, or improves. They feel better. It's not just a language trick. People feel better when they stop and refuel their tank. So, well, that's really interesting. That's it's this really mundane thing people don't like, yet it actually improves their mood. It makes them feel great. That's interesting. Well, OK, what can we do with that? And then the second thing that really uh, we observed, it's less of an insight, more of an observation, I guess, is that just as that's a contrast between the, what people say and how it makes them feel, the mundane reality of stopping at a gas station bears no resemblance to how gas stations show up in popular culture. It's a category that's really bizarrely and dramatically infused into pop culture. If you are watching a movie or reading a book or listening to a song and the protagonists turn into a gas station, you pretty much know that some kind of shit is going down. Like it's, not an, it's, not, it's not an incidental stop. It's not like, well, they turned and then they left and it was fine, they got some Doritos and filled the tank and they go, something's going to happen, someone will die, someone will be shot, stuff often explodes as it happens, strangely enough. Someone's going to leave, someone's going to join, there's going to be a moment of reflection, something's going to happen. That's kind of weird and it's really consistent. Again, there's this tension between the reality and then how it shows up in culture. And you see it across pop culture in lots of different ways and across the decades as well. Gas stops aren't incidental. They're an inflection point. They're a catalytic point in people's day where it changes direction and, you know, things happen. Or as I think our favorite uh, pop culture reference, which became the kind of central point on the pitch wall that we kept coming back to, um, was from uh, Jake and Elwood in the film The Blues Brothers. Many of you will know it. You know, it's 106 miles to Chicago. We've got a full tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes. It's dark, and we're wearing sunglasses. Hit it. And that moment, which we called the Elwood moment, although I think it may have been Jake that said it, but details, um, that moment was what was going on in people's lives. 
there's, in our own way, it may just be, well, now I've got my latte and it's uh, six miles to my kid's dance class, but it's a moment when your day changes direction and you have an enforced moment where you have to stop and you're, you've been somewhere, literally, and you're going somewhere else in your daily life. So let's focus on that. Let's look at that moment, which is always right with potential because it's by definition between two parts of your, your, your life, and focus on that uh, potential that you have before you go to wherever you're going next. And if that's a lens that's kind of a universal lens, we can then point that lens at those different audiences, very different parts of the world, and say, okay, well, what is that moment of potential? Like I said, those guys in suburban St. Louis for Philip 66, that's really purposeful day in, day out stuff. It's drop off the kids, pick up the kids, get the laundry, uh, get to dance class, get to, you know, get to school, get back from school, don't forget the shopping, where's the dog, you know. It's really living that day-to-day -day full life and that's the fabric of a great lived life, of, a, you know, of an enjoyable life. Uh, when you go to college kids in Denver, it's much more ephemeral. It's more about the fun of, okay, where are we going on Tuesday afternoon or Friday night or what are we doing this weekend? And then once you infuse that kind of West Coast cultural um, sensibility around what driving means in California, it's much more about expansive adventure. And it's, again, an age group that aren't so tied down by kids, so you can really go to a more aspirational, more adventurous place. So that's what we did. We to each, uh, each uh, brand, and then for Philip 66, it was very straight. It was about celebrating that everyday living, and um, whether it was the dad who I think you see here taking his daughter's uh, basketball team from you know victory to defeat to defeat to victory, back and forth, driving between all of the, the games that they're they're going to, or uh, the uh, one of the other um, TV spots for this was all about the incredibly misnamed stay-at-home parent or stay-at-home mom who, if you ever actually look at that audience, they are never at home. They're in their car, driving places, doing stuff, pick up the kids, drop off the kids, get the laundry, go to the vet, all these things that make up daily life. For Conoco, um, if you ever want to get as close to an acid trip without actually taking any drugs as, as possible, go look at some of the work for this. It was done with Jimmy Marble and uh, some uh, other animators, really tongue-in-cheek going at this idea of choosing go rather than stay in life. So it's focused on that moment of inflection where you can choose to do nothing or you can choose to do something and encouraging people to, to choose to something. And then 76 followed a couple as they kind of, you know, not quite sold up everything, but uh, decided to embrace van life and go out exploring in the uh, Californian countryside. So you'll get a very brief sense here, I'm not going to show all the creative work, but a very brief sense of, sense of some of the video behind that. You can see that it's very, very different in style to each other, but it's all coming from that central underlying insight of the inflection point or that moment of possibility at the pump and deciding what you go and do next. Um, in the spirit of getting everyone to coffee and bathrooms, I'll go through this quickly, but one of the fun things about doing very regionally focused campaigns is by definition, you're spending money in very tightly uh, focused ways, so you can look very clearly at, okay, what was our overall lift versus prior year, and then in the markets where we were spending most money, how much lift we were getting, so we could very clearly see that yes, we were having an impact overall, but when we were over-investing in places like Denver or St. Louis, you could really see the impact being much larger. Um, it's all, I was thinking it's super important to know, well, well the, there was a result from spending money, but it, did it work the way you intended it to? And again, this was about just nudging people to turn left rather than right. It was about feeling better about the brand. So when we looked at the brand tracking metrics, and this is within kind of a quarter of launch, so that very early on. But um, across the board, you had metrics improving. You had a warmer, richer, fuller brand for all three brands. And on basic things like standout and likability, we were beating our benchmarks and, and beating the competition. That was all uh, super important for uh, particularly Conoco, because it's like spent 10 to 1 by the average brand in the market, and a lot more by some of the leading competitors. So it's only spending 12% of what the average fuel brand spends. So very focused, very targeted, 
Um, and we were able to see that not only were we getting those metric increases, but when you look at very tactical things, we were able to get a much better cost efficiency um, because of the creative work that we were putting into market. So that's that. Let's get to some coffee and cigarettes or whatever <laughs> that takes our fancy. Thank you very much. <laughs>